I started the Baltimore Democratic Forum last year when the Mount Rural Democratic Club closed, and we wanted to come up with another idea to promote thinking in Baltimore and to educate the populace about topics in that are of concern to everyone. When I registered to vote when I was 18, I came home and my mother and father said, so what did you decide to do? I said, I registered as a Democrat. My father laughed. He said, well, this is great, Kim. We got one Republican, one independent, one, Re one Democrat in the house. And I said, great. And then within a few years, I converted everybody. I also would like to ask you to please drink whatever you'd like, as much as you'd like, because Russell's being very kind to let us use this venue to have our meetings, and I really appreciate Russell's, the gentleman who owns Wind Up Space. I would like to very much thank Lester and Lisa for being here, and I know that in, in the audience there are people that I spoke to or emailed who were also going to speak, but we're going to just open it up for form conversation afterwards. So Lester Spence, who is assistant professor at Hopkins, political opinion, and Lisa Simeone, who's an independent journalist, formerly with NPR. What I'm going to do is talk a little bit about Occupy, what it represents. Then I'm going to be talking about um, Occupy Baltimore, just had its two-month anniversary recently. I'm going to talk a little bit about where to go from here. And to a certain extent, I'm going to be repeating comments I've made in other places just a few to, uh, at 2640 the other day. But then what I'd like to do is kind of talk about uh, an aspect of the movement that I didn't talk about, uh, the, the role of culture in movements in general, and in institutions like the wind-up space in movements in general. And if I feel that I'm going too long, what I'm going to do is give the mic to Lisa and then iterate these comments, that I, the things that I don't cover, iterate them in, in question and answer. My name is Lester Spence. I'm an assistant professor of political science at Johns Hopkins University. I specialize in urban politics, in racial politics, and uh, public opinion, or I teach, rather, those courses, uh, black politics, and I, but I specialize in general in the study of political inequality. I consider myself a supporter of the Occupy movement. Right? So for me, the reason I support the Occupy movement is kind of twofold, and they're related. The first is because if you look at uh, simple measures of income inequality, from say 1929 to now, what you'd see, if you were to plot that on a curve, you'd see it looks like a U, right? With really, really high levels in 1929, low levels in the 50s and 60s, and then really high levels now, right? Now, one argument for that is that it's kind of natural, that the reason we have high levels of, any, uh, of inequality is kind of a function of uh, like people's capital changes, the economy, uh, the economy shifts, and some people just end up getting left out, and, and a, a variety of other kind of natural, biological type um, arguments. I would argue instead that the reason why we have really, really high levels of political inequality uh, in the late 20s, early 30s, and now is because of politics, because of a series of political decisions that makes, um, that privileges certain populations at the expense of others, right? Um, and those others, that the number of others is growing, right? Now, that's the first reason. So what's related to that is that I'm really interested in this idea of the public broadly considered as being the space where we can get together and figure out what's in our best interest as a whole as opposed to our specific interests, right? So when I think about, um, when I think about the array of ways that kind of the public has been truncated, so here's one way to think about it. Thanksgiving just happened on Thursday. For those of you who celebrated it, show by sign of hands how many of you talked about politics. So more than I think, right? But there are a number of people who have, right? Think about the number of spaces that you're in, the number of public spaces you're in, whether you're waiting for a bus, where you just happen to be on the street. Um, think about all those spaces and the degree to which you use those spaces for political discussions, 
right? In most cases, we believe that it's impolite or inappropriate to discuss <laughs> politics in public spaces. In a way, it's also become inappropriate to act on politics in public spaces, right? So I appreciate the Occupy movement for two reasons. One, because they bring into stark relief the level of income inequality that we have now, right? That's really, really incredibly high, higher than any point since 1929. And they also bring into stark relief the way that what we think of as the public has been narrowed. Right? And this has real political consequences. If I can't uh, talk, if I don't feel comfortable to um, talk about politics in a straightforward way, if I don't feel comfortable to protest what I think about our, um, what I think are public ills, then that reduces my ability to participate in the larger polity or in the larger state. And then that reduces our ability to have freedom in either our workplace, in our homes, in our schools, in a wide variety of institutions that we work in. So Occupy works in that gap. It, 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 so one way to think about um, the effect of Occupy, for those of you who are wondering what's the effect of this rhetoric, before Occupy Wall Street, if you did a keyword search for the most important issues of the day in Sunday news, in the New York Times that were uttered by political elites of any type, the thing we were all talking about was debt and debt reduction. Right? Nobody was talking about poverty. Nobody was talking about inequality, I mean, except people on the left. Um, there are a whole ride of, no one was talking about um, the types of life or death issues that people in places like Baltimore and Detroit, where I grew up, are dealing with every day. After Occupy, all of a sudden, for the first time that I can remember, we begin talking about inequality seriously. Right? For the first time, even members of the GOP, even members of America's more conservative political party, were talking about the necessity of dealing with income inequality. Now, their poly policy prescriptions were a bit off, but still they felt like they had to talk about it. That's, the, one, of the that's one of the clear benefits of Occupy where it brings in the stark relief for the first time, it begins a conversation for the first time in a generation about income inequality, about inequality in a variety of different forms. Right. Um, but the question is, as we segue, again, Baltimore is two months, a number of other places have been moved on, Oakland, LA, I believe Philly, and a few other places, where do we go to next, or what, what, what's the next thing for Occupy? Um, first, I think it's important to mention, to note what Occupy is and how it's different, I believe, at, at least at the outset, from other similar movements or from other uh, historical movements. What Occupy represents is the first open source movement, right? How many of you are familiar with open source software? How many of you are familiar with the open source movement in general? Raise your hand. OK, so there's, there's some people who don't, don't know. So the open source idea is really something that's deeply embedded in the computer software industry. It's the idea of promoting something, a software, um, into, the, into the void and saying, like, listen, this is free for you to adapt, modify, change as you see fit. There are, compared to the predecessor, there are no barriers to entry. Right? So what's unique about Occupy is that even though it has a very distinct enemy, so to speak, we all know who the antagonist is, right? As far as what you do, how you can get in where you fit in, to use slang, right? It's very open, at, at least at the outset, right? But the thing is with movements is they kind of congeal. They kind of attach, they, over the time, they kind of take on a form. So I'll, I mentioned this uh, at 2640 St. Paul. So if you were to go to Occupy Baltimore's website now, two months later, what they say is Occupy Baltimore is uh, dedicated to a certain political project, and it's located at McKeldin Square, which is the space that Occupy Baltimore took over. Right? That represents a moment of congealing, 
right? That is a moment of coming together and crystallizing as a pseudo organization. Now, what are the problems with that? What are the challenges with that? Now, what the open source is at, at, its, at its strength is that it's incredibly open. Anybody can join. Anybody can, as long as you take the political principle uh, to heart, right? So theoretically, at the outset, it's not that hard to imagine black people who are dealing with foreclosure or, um, or poverty in East Baltimore starting in Occupy Baltimore. It's not that hard to imagine homeless people who are dealing with shelter issues starting in Occupy Baltimore. It's not that difficult to imagine same-sex couples who want to increase their health, um, their health benefits creating Occupy Baltimore in different spaces dealing with different issues but using the same label, right? And you can imagine what challenges that would cause to anti-Occupy forces, right? Will they get a call that Occupy Baltimore is acting over here, and it's over here, and it's over here, and it's over here, and it's over here, and all at the same time, right? It's not that hard to imagine how hard it would, it would be like dealing with how many of you have been attacked by a bee swarm? Right? So to be the equivalent of, be, of dealing with a bee swarm, right? Now the challenge is that once the organization congeals, you're no longer necessarily talking about a swarm. You're talking about an individual bee, right? No longer are you talking about an issue, uh, an organization that's incredibly inclusive that, some, that, um, that black people in Baltimore can deal with, that um, Latino undocumented workers can deal with and glom onto without being at McKeldin Square, that homeless people, that gays interested in health benefits can deal with. It becomes just this McKeldin Square thing. And then it becomes at some point about defending McKeldin Square, right? And that creates a number of challenges. So to a certain extent, it's like what, what Occupy, I, I feel uncomfortable saying what Occupy needs to do, given I'm just a supporter. But what I would love to see is I would love to see an Occupy that proliferates, that as many different issues that can conceivably be, be fought over within this public space, we have Occupy um, Baltimore's. Right? So I believe in this room we have members of Occupy. I know we have some Occupy Baltimore people. Um, we also have Occupy um, Michael people and Occupy Towson people. Right? People who are dealing with issues of student debt and other things on college campuses. I would love to see like these spaces too be Occupy Baltimore. Right? That, I mean that would be awesome to me. Right? Because that would be that, that would be inclusive in ways that we haven't seen in the 21st century. Um, and now I'm realizing I'm going to go get a bit long, so a lot of my other comments I'll bleed into the question and answer. What I also like to see is we have, I like to see, one of the benefits of having this event in the wind up as opposed to a political space is that further increases our conception of the public. So one of my undergraduate students, I was, I was inviting her to the event, she was of drinking age, and she <laughs> was like the wind up, I just drink there. You know, I just dance there, right? I mean, why would you have it in the wind up? It's like, well, the thing is, part of the whole concept of retaking the public is about extending the political into spaces that we don't necessarily think of as political spaces. Bingo. In the places like the wind up, into our churches, into our schools, into the streets. Because the only way that we can remake this, um, this space we're in, the only way we can create more openness for a wide array of political, uh, political beliefs, even though I happen to be on the left, is to actually retake the public. It's to make spaces for places like the wind up, even on their DJ night, to aggressively talk about politics. And then the other aspect of that is really to deeply Think about the role of culture, popular culture and high culture, like low culture and high culture, in generating ideas and support for the belief that poverty is not the function of genetic traits or cultural traits. It's the function of processes that are political. 
right? So, so whether that is about radical theater, um, got my man Matt in the back, he's an artist over in Hamden, has really, really great work, whether it's about fi a visual art, whether it's about sonic art. I'm working on a project um, to basically, uh, my first book was on hip hop and black politics. So my, I'm working on a project that will create a space for young Baltimore spoken word and rap artists to speak to this school to prison pipeline issue, right? To generate support, to, to generate interest in the issue and to show that locally produced hip hop can deal with more than the very narrow themes they deal with, right? So that's what I think the project is about. That's a little bit about where we go from here. Uh, I'm gonna give room for Lisa, and then to extend about, I've got other comments, I'm going to embed them in the question and answer process. Thank you so much for having this. Thank you so much for inviting me. I see some of this. So some people here have been, how many people have been to an Occupy, an occupation? Okay, people on this side of the room. <laughs> okay, so a lot of people haven't been. People to on the left side. <laughs> I want to talk about the uh, different occupations in D.C., how they're similar, how they're different from other occupations around the country, and what the, the impression has been in the public and in the press when the press finally bothered, when they finally deigned to pay mm. attention to the occupation. I'm involved in the occupation at Freedom Plaza. There are two occupations in D.C. Some of you all might know that and some people might not. There are two occupations. The way this happened was um, our occupation at Freedom Plaza got started, not physically, but started the planning stages last spring. We started having meetings last spring before there was an Occupy Wall Street, before anybody was talking about this, except, except people in Greece, people in Spain, people in Egypt. And we had conference calls with people in Greece, people in Spain, and people in Egypt to talk about their experiences and their occupations and to ask them for their advice and just some pointers and things to expect. So we started planning this, like old, old, meaning seasoned. When I say old, I'm 54. Some of these people are younger than me. Some of them are older. But I mean, some seasoned activists who had been you know, working on the left for all these years, nothing is being accomplished, working for electoral reform, which is a waste of flipping time. I will try not to cuss tonight. I have a very potty mouth, but I will try not to do that. <laughs> it's a freaking waste of time because both parties are the same. And if you think they aren't, you are living in the past. You gotta get this through your heads. Both parties are the same. They are here to put the boot to your neck to screw you and to make sure that their own people retain their wealth and the rest of us don't get any of it. So if you think you're going to win by electoral politics, really, you really got to get this out of your head. Anyway, that's why I got involved, because I got fed up and didn't know what to do. So this group coalesced. Um, these people had known each other from way before. I came into the group in, in like March when I got arrested at the White House, and then we started planning for this occupation at Freedom Plaza. <laughs> we chose October 6th for a few reasons. October 6th was the 10th anniversary of our war in Afghanistan. I hate to use the nice word anniversary, but that's what it was. 10 years, starting the 11th year in Afghanistan, no end in sight, which again is the point. People are making money off of these wars. It's not only about ideology, it is about that, but it's also about profit. People are making money off of a permanent state of war. That's why we're still there. So that was one anniversary, October 6th. But also it was the beginning of the, the fiscal 2012 austerity budget which preached austerity for everybody else, you know, for all, for all of us peons, but continuing wealth for the people in power. So it was dual. That's why we chose October 6th. We didn't know if anybody was going to show up. We're thinking, well, we're going to put up tents. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We don't even know if anyone's going to show up. Then what happens? Adbusters puts out this notice in August, go, go Occupy Wall Street. And Occupy Wall Street shows up. It's like this wonderful historical accident, this happy, thrilling, thrilling flowering of citizenship all over the country. Occupy Wall Street starts, it stays, it has staying power, the press ignores it until the people got pepper sprayed, that was nine days later, finally the press pays attention to it, and in the meantime other occupations are going up around the country. So in D.C., Occupy D.C., which is in McPherson Square, started on October 1st. That's kind of when a lot of the national occupies did it, and Baltimore's did too. I, I, well, it was October 1st, right? Four. For those of you, fourth? October okay. Four. So ours was planned to be October 6th, so we did it October 6th. So now there are two occupations in D.C. And as Lester said, I mean, I actually agree with this. People are like, oh, no, you should all be united, and it should be solidarity. You should all be one occupation. I'd be thrilled if there were 10 occupations in any given city. That would mean 10 times as many people would be forced to walk by it and be confronted by an occupation and have to see it and have to think about what's going on. So I do not see it as a, 
as a drawback. I see it as a benefit that there are two occupations in DC, but of course you'll hear people say that it's not good. Um, uh, here was our plan from the beginning. We, we did what some of the purists will say was not good, was not sufficiently uh, radical. We got a permit for the first four days, okay? So October 6th was a Thursday, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we got a permit because we knew thousands of people were coming from around the country, and we wanted to be able to stay. And then we were determined to have a, confronta a confrontation, meaning to stand up to the police if it came to that, and to stay on Sunday night when our permit expired at 10 o'clock. It did expire at 10 o'clock. We all agreed amongst us, when I say us, there's a steering committee of about 50 people from all over the country, most of whom came to Freedom Plaza on October 6th. We all got together and agreed, who's gonna risk arrest, who's gonna go to jail, who has to stay here and hold down the fort. I was one of the people to hold and stay down the fort to talk to the press, which later got me into trouble. But anyway, <laughs> I was one of the press people. Um, so, and then all these other people were like, and then they got up on stage and then said, this is why we're gonna risk arrest. Those of you who don't want to can leave. We're not, that's not our purpose. It's not to get people thrown in jail. And we're not saying you should come and get arrested. For people who don't feel comfortable with that, that's cool, you know, we totally respect that. So those people who didn't want to could, could go out and take their stuff away. And those who wanted to get arrested were gonna stay. So we went right up to 10 o'clock with some really powerful speeches saying some powerful things, even though we had had good relations with the police up till that point, there were some powerful things said on stage. And at the last minute, the police decided, you know, no, we're not going to arrest you. No, you can stay. Okay, so after that, we have stayed and put up tents, which we don't have. You never had a permit. We never had a permit for tents or sleeping bags. You're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to sleep in a federal park. We're in a federal park. That's what Freedom Plaza is considered. McPherson Plaza Square is different. McPherson Square deals, deals with the DC City Police. We deal with the Park Police. We have people who have dealt with the Park Police for years, and there's a mutually respectful relationship for now. We're not under any illusions about what happens when it comes time to crack skulls. I'm sure they'll crack skulls. But for now, we have a very mutually respectful relationship with the police. We have tents. We have much bigger structures. We have a yurt. You know, we have projection screens. We have the propane gas burners, none of which you're allowed to have in the kitchen. None of that stuff you're allowed to have. But the reason we've been able to stay so far, I think, I mean, you don't know what's going on in the police, in the mind of the police, but so far I think it's because we do have this respectful relationship. We tell them everything we're gonna do. We're, they can come and look. We're not doing anything. You know, nobody's got any guns. Nobody's shooting heroin there. We have a lot of homeless people who have found a community, a community in the literal and metaphorical sense. Um, and they have become important members of the, of the occupation. But we also have problems. You know, we're not equipped to deal with mental illness, for God's sake, because these poor people have been thrown out by the society, the society who's decided we don't care about people with mental illness and drug addiction. So yes, they gravitate, we, but we can't, you know, that's not, you, you hear people criticize this in the press. <coughs> oh, you know, you have all these people who are gonna cause problems. Hello, the reason these people are out the street is because they don't have proper health care, they don't have proper, proper mental health care or physical health care, and they've been discarded by society. So yes, they gravitate to occupations. That, that's just a problem. That, I mean, that's, it's both a boon and a problem. It's a problem when, when somebody threatens violence. We've had very little of that at Freedom Plaza, like very little. But it happens, and the Spaniards and the Greeks and the Egyptians warned us that this would happen, you know? And as the weather gets colder, you're gonna attract more people who have no place else to go. But so far, the police have been like, cool with us, we're cool with them. They send somebody through every day to just videotape and take pictures of what's going on. We've moved our tents so many times to accommodate other people because it's, Freedom Plaza is a public park, and other people have um, events scheduled there, like AIDS events or other things, so we've moved our tents to accommodate them. We're not there to kick anybody out. So far, so good. But at some point, um, you know, the crackdown's gonna come. At some point, the police are gonna say, you have to leave, and then it's gonna be up to people there to decide, am I willing to be arrested, am I not? I'm willing to be arrested for that. I don't wanna personally throw away, quote unquote, my arrests on everything. I don't wanna get arrested for everything that comes down the pike. I mean, there's different philosophies about this. I just think it's kind of like, I don't want to be a professional arrestee. I want to do it when I think there's really a point to it, and so I'm willing to be arrested when the police come to throw everybody out to make a stand of solidarity, but not everybody's willing to do that. Um, the point of the occupation, of the Occupy movement to me, to quote Kevin Zeese, who is one of the old time activists who helped organize this in Freedom Plaza, is to create a culture of resistance. 
If people don't even get it into their heads that it's possible to resist, then they don't do it. A right unexercised is a right that you don't have. Just like a muscle, people say, use it or lose it. It's the same with your rights. You might think these rights are enshrined in the Constitution, but that's a lot of bullshit because they're not enshrined if people do not actively engage those rights and use those rights. So many of our rights have been eviscerated. Both administrations, meaning the Bush and Obama, is just a continuation of the Bush administration. It's a lot of hogwash to pretend otherwise. He has not only continued, but he has expanded the worst abuses of the Bush administration. So our rights are shrinking before our eyes. The Occupy movement is a movement of resistance. It's a way of saying, no, you cannot do this. And if you try, I will at least stand up and say something about it and use my body. You cannot, I'm gonna say this again, I said it at the beginning, going into the voting booth and casting your ballot doesn't mean shit anymore. I'm sorry, but it doesn't. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sick of hearing that, oh, if we don't yeah. vote Democrat, the Republicans will win. So big deal, so they'll win. What difference does it make? Going into a voting booth now doesn't matter. You gotta put your body on the line. What are you willing to do physically to change things? Who, what, what statements are you willing to make? Who are you willing to stand up to? What are you willing to say to make a change? Going into a voting booth is meaningless. It's meaningless. You're just deluding yourselves. Um, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very passionate about this because y you know, if we, don't, if we don't do something different in this country, we are, we are heading, the doors to fascism are wide open. That is not hyperbole. That is what's happening in this country. Our civil rights are evaporating. Uh, we're in a permanent state of war. The, the, the evils that we're perpetrating on other nations around the world, not surprisingly, are coming back to be visited on ourselves. History teaches us that. We should be able to look at that. Anything you do to somebody else, oh, those other people, those others, you know, they're just Afghanis, they're just Iraqis, they're just Pakistanis, Somalis, Yemenis, whatever. Everything we do, the horrors that we perpetrate on other people around the world, what makes anybody think that those horrors won't be perpetrated on us? If push comes to shove, you don't think people will be rounded up in jail? That's already happening. Muslims are being rounded up. I mean, they're being, they're being put in jail on the, most, on the flimsiest of charges. And so far, people are like, oh, well, you know, it's not happening to me. It's not happening to my loved ones. It's not happening to anybody I know, so no big deal. We have to make a stand. And, and the only question is, what's gonna happen to the Occupy movement? Because things are gonna get worse before they get better. The, the police brutality that we've seen is just the beginning. It is the tip of the iceberg. It's a sign of how seriously the powers that be take this movement. At the beginning, they ignored it because they thought, who gives a shit? You know, these people are a bunch of you know, drunk hippies. Who cares what they do? They ignored it. Once they started taking it seriously, that's when the crackdown started. And the brutality has just continued. And it's going to get worse. 2012 being an election year, it is going to get way worse. Scott Walker has already said he's going to start charging anybody who demonstrates 50 bucks an hour just for showing up and demonstrating. Bloomberg has said outright, I don't need Washington. I don't need the feds. I have my own, um, my own police force here. And he does. He has his own army in New York City. So it's going to get worse. The brutality is going to get worse. The question is, what do we do? What do we do with the Occupy movement? Are we going to occupy buildings? Some of us are talking about that, especially because it's freaking freezing out there. And why should people have to sleep on a cold plaza? I haven't been. I've been sleeping in a bed every night. I'm a wimp. I admit it. I have not been camping out in Freedom Plaza. But you know, are we going to occupy a building and squat? Are we going to turn it into um, a small marketplace where people have their wares? Or what are we going to do? Are we going to just lay? We could lay low for the winter. There's no, there's no disrespect in that. We could come back in the spring. We can have a, a bus tour. There's a lot of plans going on. What are we going to do? But it's up to everybody to make up their mind and to decide what they're going to do for this for this Occupy movement. A couple people arrive from Micah, Occupy Micah. John Fleischner's here from Occupy Micah, and I asked him if he would say a few Good. words from the perspective of a student-run Occupy force. So I'd like John to speak, and then once he speaks, we'll open it up for general discussion. And I want to say that I'm by no means a leader of um, the Oc Occupy Micah movement because the point is everyone is a leader. We're all leaders. My peers over here are leaders. That's at the core of this movement is that we all act autonomously and then come together as a group. We use lateral decision making in the form of formal consensus model, what all the Occupy camps use. Our friend Judy has been helping us learn this. I think it's really important that we learn this model 
and uh, as like we're seniors and upperclassmen, and there's some underclassmen in our group too, but a lot of us are seniors, and I think if we learn this model, we can take it to where we go for employment, so everyone has an equal voice. Students are the next wave in this movement. Organized labor joined up a long time ago. Students are a huge part of this movement. People will be paying off their debt until their 40s, and that'll deeply impact how we live. We're not gonna be getting married you know, as early. We're not gonna be having kids as early. We won't own houses. We won't have, have cars. Our assets will not be the same as the last generation. As a, as a group, as our group, Occupy MICA, we've um, just tried to do a lot of things to help Occupy Baltimore. We went down on Saturday night under threat of eviction to try and, you know, um, just witness and, and see what happened and take pictures and video and, you know, distribute it if that had happened. It, thankfully, it didn't happen because I think it's very important that Occupy Mike is, or Occupy Baltimore is there because that's, that's a place to go to talk about these issues. And that's how I, that's how we kind of started this group. We saw that there and then came back to our school and started doing our own thing. We also have been painting signs for the Young Trade Unionist March on, uh, that's tomorrow, tomorrow night, to show solidarity with the unions. Yeah, we're also in interested in how we can impact like our school and the greater art com community because that's very hierarchical and um, you know difficult for young artists to break through into that. Yeah, so I guess that's all I have to say. If anybody has any questions about what we're doing, just let me know. You know, real quickly, you didn't talk about you know when do you guys start? You know, what are you guys doing? Oh yeah, we some uh, one individual put out the call for to to do an Occupy Micah group and said the General Assembly will be tonight at 10 o'clock and that's all it took and there were 70 people there. It um, got off to a little bit of a rough start, but um, as we learn the model, it's we're making things you know go a little bit more smoothly. Uh, we have GAs every night, General Assemblies every night, so you know to really hash out what we're doing. So yeah, I just think it's important for every institution to start their own Occupy, you know, start like learn consensus model. It's like really cool. Any anybody academic should would be interested in consensus model. So yeah. okay. So I'm gonna leave it up to you guys. If if everybody we just usually we do Q and A written, but I I like the, our groups of size. It's manageable. So hand and hand and choice hand first. Um, I'll leave I'll leave yeah, the speaker. Sorry, just the first piece. Maybe we should do a stack. <laughs> What? Stack. We should do a stack. Let's do a stack. <laughs> Can we do a stack? stack? Who's going to keep stack? Anyway, so, so that's this, what we will do. So oh, he's on stack, and this gentleman here is, is this. Oh, okay. she's getting her own pen. <laughs> uh, my name is Bill Marker. I just spent ten thousand dollars, five weeks of leave, and missed doing summer activities with my wife, who has since gotten significantly ill, running for city council. And we're sitting here at a Democratic club, and I'm not going to accept this bullshit. Do I think it's perfect? Hell no. When I ended up endorsing Obama because Richardson was out of the campaign three years ago, was it, you know, the less, the more liberal of the two con relatively conservative Democrats? Yes. But I'm not going to sit here, particularly with the history of this club, whatever, and just accept this bullshit. What living in the past is, is people on the left not getting in and fighting in the trenches. And I, w I it is, a, we need leftward pressure inside the Democratic Party. Yes, there's rich people there, and yes, they're protesting their, their, their backsides, their front sides, or all their sides. And I've thought about, had I won, would I be spending time in Occupy figuring out how to make, make connections, and what role would I be playing in terms of when it is ever clearing and whatever. Yes, there should be anger. Yes, there should be frustration. I'm not talking third parties. I'm talking about in the Democratic primary where low numbers vote, I will not quietly accept that it's bullshit. To, I mean, the, the minor thing of people going to the polls is very, is, isn't much, but it's a place, if we really want to talk about numbers, that's where the numbers are, and it's reaching people. Locally, I still think we have some influence locally, but on the national level, I just categorically reject that voting for a Democrat's gonna make a difference. It's just, they have totally, I, I, they have totally sold out. And Obama has really sold out, and it's, it's just stunning. I think it's really important for us to have discussions that are just on the left as opposed to like a Democrat or Republican and Independent because there's a great deal of variance on the, le on the left liberal axis that you can't get if you've got somebody on the right, somebody in the middle, and somebody on the left. So in this case, I think it's good because we've got a little bit, we've got some difference. I 
I agree that working on the assumption that the Democratic Party is the place for us to situate our, um, our stuff politically is, is problematic. But I wouldn't make the claim that involving in national politics or local politics doesn't matter. Because the reality is that there are very real life and death circumstances that we can attach. That there are people who are literally alive because Obama's in office rather than Bush. Right? Now, no, it, I mean, it's, it, and, and understand, I'm not making a political claim, I'm making an empirical claim. Right? That is, I'm not, I'm making, I, I don't support De Obama in some ways more than I could throw him, but empirically, there are literally people who wouldn't be alive if Obama wasn't in office. And so the question is, is given that, how do we take this energy and make a set of claims on the state? I'm a parent of not one, not two, but five kids. And I can point to the number of ways that having a national Demo jacked Democrat party in office helps me and my five kids eat. I can point to empirically a number of ways. So with that said, though, the larger critiques that both systems, uh, that both parties support um, a set of policies that are problematic, the, Democrat, the Senate just supported, just voted in a policy that will allow the president to declare um, anybody as like a threat to the state. Yeah, yeah. National Defense uh, Authorization. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, that's serious. So the question is, what do we do? What I would suggest is that it's not about individuals. It's not about us casting a vote for Obama or us casting a vote for a progressive like Donna Edwards in the state. It's about us figuring what our policies are and, and getting people to support our policies. There is a reason why Social Security hasn't been taken from us, even given, even though we've had a number of moments when conservatives or conservative Republicans have run the House. It's because there's unanimity, there's consensus on that. Right? There's a consensus that's been built. George Bush tried to repeal, tried to roll that back. Obama's tried to roll that back. But he can't. I mean, but they can. It's about building consensus for a set of policies, material policies, that benefit our lives, and less so about a given individual. Uh, so, to the, uh, so I would slightly disagree with Lisa and say, politics are incredibly important, both locally and nationally. But I'd agree and say it's not about people, it's about material policies that change our lives. Tom, you're next. My name's Tom Hassler. I used to be a reporter for the Sun, so I have a bit of a background on this kind of thing. We're following it closely. I have a friend who's a very active in the D.C. Occupy movement, and I'm getting uh, detailed reports from him. The labor movement's uh, very much be getting behind them in support. I've been uh, mostly interested in how this can have a practical impact, and I disagree also a little bit with Lisa because I think uh, some Democrats, some de uh, Democratic politicians uh, are pretty good. Uh, I thought I wouldn't give up on politics per se, or the gentleman over there, but I think there are also some, some movements out there or some groups that are trying to break the gridlock and trying to do an independent kind of approach. One's called No Labels, one's called The Third Way, and one call, it's called America Elects. They're all the websites, they're all trying to find a way beyond the gridlock. But I, I found the comments about the diversifying the impact of Occupy very interesting, and particularly, I mean, the media, I think, has done a pretty lousy job in covering this. So I'll be doing my own sort of personal reporting. Yeah, well, the media is a big part of the problem because most of the media, of course, is, uh, is consolidated. These are consolidated corporations, and they don't have anything to gain. They don't really care. These are people who are making huge amounts of money. Not the reporters, but I mean the people who own them. But, but that, that's, a, that's a conventional argument. The, the publishers always are wealthy, and of course the reporters are, uh, are doing their job. But usually, I mean, the sun has really gone downhill since my, since my day. It's really nothing. Uh, but, Generally, reporters try to do a decent job, well, um, depends. but they, they're not always sympathetic, they're not always uh, understanding. I, I, I guess I'm much more um, 
in sync with Noam Chomsky, who wrote Manufacturing Consent, about so much of the uh, societal hierarchy is, uh, has been absorbed, imbued on these people, that they, they, that they don't even, a lot of these reporters, they don't even recognize that they're a part of this system that just does things the conventional way by road. They don't even, they can't even see it. Some do and some don't. The doc, of I mean, course, I mean, I'm not speaking of every single reporter, but most reporters, they're, look, they want to keep their job, I get that. A lot of them are losing <laughs> their jobs, a lot of them have lost their jobs. But I know from my experience at NPR for many years that, for instance, I'll give you one concrete example. Before Abu Ghraib broke, yep. be way before, when we had already invaded Afghanistan and Iraq, I was saying to so many reporters and producers, I can't even tell you, why don't we do a historical report on the, the use of torture? The use of torture by nations in wartime. This has always happened. What makes us think it's not going to happen now? You know what they all said to me? There's no story there. There's no story there. What do you mean there's no story? Well, we don't have any evidence. I understand that, but why can't you do an historical account of we've tortured in the past, other countries have tortured, what makes us think that we're not going to torture again? No, there's no story there, there's no story there. You're a freak, basically. You're Lisa, you're a freak. Then Abu Ghraib broke, and it's like, oh, we're so shocked. How the hell can you be shocked? How can you be shocked unless you're a moron or you haven't been paying attention? And these reporters were all upstanding, fine upstanding people individually, but they have absorbed the ethos of the organization which says, if there's not evidence for it, there's no story there. I, as you probably do tell, I'm not a, uh, born here. I'm on a third, third citizenship. So I rely on inter international resor uh, resources. When the uh, war in Iraq started, I immediately uh, started getting the Spiegel online, which has an English version, mm -hmm. English language version, yep. because the Spiegel was the most, uh, most finally opposed to the Iraq war in Europe. And so I started getting, uh, and it's free, I, I get the uh, Spiegel even now, because I am, a, even though we're 45 minutes away from DC, don't like DC oriented news. And most media sucked into the DC news uh, cycle kind of thing. It's great, but, but that's, and, and I think, there, and Der Spiegel also did a lot of reports on torture before any American papers did, but the question is, why aren't American papers, why weren't they doing this? Well, I am just interested in European and international news. I don't rely on U.S. newspapers anymore. Yeah, I rely on either. The Economist and the Financial Times, because even the New York Times or, Wall Street, uh, or the uh, Washington Post, to me, a week, those areas. Debka, dot com for, for Israel or Middle East, uh, Middle East, even though it's very Israeli. So the challenge that Occupy has is the proliferation, or one challenge, is the proliferation challenge, right? That is, how do we take this idea and allow it to be an idea such that, again, people with different sets of interests can glom onto it, right? Because if you think about Baltimore, there are, Baltimore is a really big city. There are a number of people with very different sets of interests. Black working class people in Baltimore have very different interests than even black upper class and upper income people, much less necessarily uh, white MICA students, just to, just to point to a population, just a given, a given population that I have a great deal of appreciation for, right? So how do we take this idea and make it open and keep it open? Because the tendency is going to be to, to close it, right? To like, listen, Occupy is this. I am Occupy. If you're not doing what I do, then you're not Occupy. That's the natural tendency, right? Then the other, so I think there are a number of material, a number of policies that people can glom onto, particularly during the winter, right? So, the, so some people argue that the next natural stage is the foreclosure issue. Right. And there are actually people who I think are working on, there's an action, is that tomorrow? I think there's a, the foreclosure act. The there foreclosure is action is either, it's on a Tuesday, it's either this yeah, Tuesday yeah. or the, I think it's next Tuesday. or the next Tuesday. Tomorrow's the union march. Yeah, oh, got you, I got you. So if we think about foreclosure, for example, I know a number of people, in fact, in some ways I resemble that remark, about who <laughs> foreclosure is a significant issue and that is kind of a natural way to point to how material policies are affecting people's material lives and a way to get communities that aren't involved already involved. 
But what's the challenge in that? Now, I agree with that. But the challenge is that is that one of the things with the occupies is that it's brought homelessness you know, into the, into the arena for the first time that I can remember, where people are talking about it seriously, right? So it's like any issue that you bring up, there are going to be issues that aren't. But that's the reason why you call for proliferation. What we're going to have to figure out is how to deal with the police issue. Because I think there's a way to deal with the threat of police repression that's actually hurtful even as it's helpful. So there are those of you, perhaps I think there may be some of you in the audience who only became aware of Occupy after the police moved on, right? And there are a number of people who gave support for Occupy only after the police moved on, whether it's in, particularly in places like Oakland and New York, right? The challenge if we rely too much on police actions we run the Martin Luther King risk. And I talked about this the other day. Martin Luther King Jr.'s greatest failure was in Albany, Georgia. There was one brilliant, but racist, br brilliant police officer who realized, like, damn, you know the way this nonviolent stuff works? This nonviolent stuff that King do is doing only works if you have violence. So if we train the police officers, to non-violently arrest protesters, then all the energy of non-violence is gonna be taken away, right? So if we work on, now we have to work on the assumption that our quote unquote enemies, to the extent that police forces, even, at, at, even as some of them might not, like, might not like to, that our police forces are kind of enemies, we have to work on the assumption that they're not stupid. Right, they're not, somebody's gonna say like, oh my God, all we have to do, instead of beating these guys up and pepper spraying them, the only thing we have to do is say, you know what, Lisa, you're gonna just have to come with me. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, I know, you just have to, have to come with me. Yeah, I'll put the good cuffs on you. Yeah, you know, whatever well, you need. I know, but here's the thing. You're right, yeah, you're yeah, absolutely that, right. The you're absolutely right, but here's the thing. Um, they are so, it's, they are so enamored of their militarization and their SWAT teams and their drone, little drones. They are so enamored. It is such a temptation. It is such a temptation that maybe their boss might even tell them, don't crack skulls, but it's so tempting to do it. And that's, and so far they've shown that they, you're right, they're not, they're supposedly not stupid, but so far they've all shown that they're willing to be very stupid. Well, here comes the yeah, well, I mean, with agree, the there's a fear factor in that very important. Yeah, 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 yes. I mean, so there are a range very, of factors. Very yes, so there are a range of factors that cause them to react. But the thing is, there are two challenges. One is we can't assume that they're that that's gonna predominate as far as their decision tree, as far as the decisions they make. But the other thing is that, to the extent, it, it, if we work too much on the idea of police repression, it becomes more about self-expression and the right to claim a space, as opposed to the serious political issues. That is a serious right? political issue. No, it is, but it's not more. That it, it, is the political issue. No, it's, yes, it's, it's, it is. No, it's, yes, it is. It is. No, it Occupy is. is Occupy. No. Yes, it is. No. Well, we disagree. There are populations for whom the right to stay in their house and not be thrown out in the street that's their, that's, that's is, their is as important that's and right. in some ways more important if you've got to make a choice you have to take between the property police away from them. That's what it means. Wait, I'm not understanding. What are you saying is the point? The property, you have to confiscate their property. If it's the park, you got to confiscate it. If it's their banks, you've got to take it over. Who are they? I don't care what party you are from or who you support. You're saying that's what the occupations have to do. Is that, is that right? It's a whole new system that needs to be recognized as the only thing that's going to be humane. Because this system, if you know what's happening, it's going down. And the only way they can ma maintain this is by repression. Look at, look at what's happening around the world. You're saying the powers that be. The powers that be can only yes. maintain this the system. The 1% exactly. Yeah. Okay. Who control all the governments and blah, blah, blah. So, but anyway, regardless whether you believe that or not, what I would like to hear from this we meant, we meant, is for everybody to start. participate. Sir, I hate to interrupt you, but I'm going to because we were doing a stack. I don't know if you 
I'm on the stack. Can I just say something? But I think the, I was on the stack before you. The purpose oh, of the stack is to diversify the conversation. Right now, the people who have the loudest voice are the ones that are talking. So to keep in accordance no, with our the kind position. of... The, it's to the keep in accordance years. with the Occupy values, I think we should diversify the conversation. Who's next one? Yes. And stack is a, is a technique used by the consensus model that, that occupies are using pretty much everywhere I know. I don't there might be a few that aren't. I have three two comments and a question based on the previous conversation. One, this whole idea of, of Obama versus whoever the Republican candidate is and I don't have any choice. There was a, I don't know if anybody's seen it, but there's a viral video going on around about what this guy talks about why he is for Obama. It's gotten hundreds of thousands of hits, and it's very good in pointing at some of the things or the things that Obama has done that has helped people since the Bush administration. But in the meantime, he has also just sent 25,000 troops into Australia, Marines. He has not veto the National Defense Authority bill, which gives the police the right to arrest anyone in the United States without due reason or cause. He's still got people working for him that created this economic dilemma. Having said all that, I think I will vote for Obama again, because I don't want a Republican in the White House. Angela Davis was at uh, Occupy New York, and she talked to this issue about um, what, and, uh, uh, whether or not Obama, and she was like, you know, really, I don't want to see a Republican. I can't, she says, I don't think we can afford a Republican. Second, about reporters. I think reporters, like social workers, professors, and other professionals, have co-opted themselves out of being responsible professors, professions. They, they've sold their souls in my book. They, they don't do journalism. They don't do social work, which was about helping the poor, but now everybody wants a private practice or has a private practice, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a matter of co-opting into this capitalist system that's part of that problem that reporters are a part of. The problem with reporters is in a democracy, you depend on the reporters reporting the facts so that you can make a responsible decision. That's what we're missing in one domain. Third, my question. And you sort of started to address this, but I have been involved with Occupy Baltimore. I went down as a videographer uh, day one just to take pictures, and then I found out on that Sunday they were going to do yoga. I know. So I thought I would go and check out yoga, and ended up at a general assembly, and was like, oh my God, they're doing consensus model. Yeah. I've been trying to do consensus in peace movement and academia and other places for decades now, and it was so exciting to me. So that's what really has pulled me in. What I like is that that's what I'm seeing conserved as this transition away from the current Occupy movement. It's one of the things. I think what we really need to look at is what do we want to conserve? What do we want to hold on to? And then we can let go of all the rest, be it the tents or whatever. But I want to conserve consensus model in general assembly, and I hope other people have other things they want to conserve and work, will work as hard as um, they can on that. So my question is, given the situation in Occupy Baltimore, if you're aware of it or not, it's, it's, it's pretty shady, if you will. It's been really difficult. There's a lot of people, the street people, who don't have homes, who are, who are part of the process. Uh, it's been difficult to deal with that, but we've dealt with it fairly well often, not always. There was a big mess this weekend. Part there's the threat of the eviction that people seem to be buying, making happen. You know, it's like you create your own reality. Um, the mayor doesn't have to do anything. She just can sit back and put out a couple of things and everybody goes like this, it seems to be. And now there's even talk, well, maybe we should walk away and da da da. So what do you think people ought to do at Occupy? Just your opinion of Baltimore. Should they stay? Should we stay? And I don't spend the night either. I go home and sleep in a warm bed. I'm sorry, I do. And I'm not ready to get arrested yet. Maybe at one point it'll get to the point that I'll make that decision where you're at, where I'm willing to get arrested for this. But how do you feel about Occupy Baltimore and whether or not they should walk away or stay and be evicted? And be with the threat of violence. Given that I am a supporter and I've gone down and talked to the people who are actively involved in Occupy Baltimore, I feel, I feel uncomfortable with making definitive statements about what Occupy Baltimore should do. I say that as kind of a disclaimer. 
Um, Thank you. With with that with that said, I can imagine. Um, I think it would be to use academic language a good look for the for McKeldin Square for people in McKeldin Square to the extent they believe that a physical occupation is necessary to think about the Baltimore is extremely large geographically to think about the number of sites geographically speaking that can be A, occupied, and B, have some political import, right? So let's take, for example, and this isn't my idea, but let's take, for example, the space they're building a youth, uh, youth to uh, adult prison on, right? That we know what that space is. For those of you who don't know, Baltimore is considering spending, I believe it's $104 million to build a youth uh, build a prison for youth who are charged as an adult. Identities, for those of you who don't know, even my identity as a black male, even her identity as a woman, are to an extent socially constructed. That is, they are constructed by the policies we enact in part. So as soon as you have a building that is for youth that are charged as adults, what happens to the identity? it becomes a lot harder to peel back. You just take it for granted. Oh, yeah, he's 15 year old. He's a 15 year old kid. He killed somebody. Yeah, they're charging me as an adult, right? When actually that identity is politically problematic, right? So what I think it would be cool to do is figure out what these spaces are in Baltimore that are politically contentious that can be used to actually bring call attention to this other political issue that deals with something that Baltimoreans have to materially deal with on an everyday basis. I have just like a point of information about that. <laughs> Very recently there has been talk of doing that and one of the locations is down here on Green Mountain North. <coughs> that would present a lot of problems. It's a very dangerous area. But um, there has been talk of that. Also, um, maybe occupying these I'm not entirely familiar with this, but there's a lot of like social centers and maybe um, like youth rec community centers. centers, rec centers that are losing funding. Right. Um, maybe oh, yes, right. pump yes. the Occupy movement into them because Occupy is doing a lot. So uh, real quick, I just complicate that um, the danger, the concept of danger is politically constructed. So if you've got a space that has um, like a hundred people in it that are staying overnight, the odds that it becomes dangerous drops. Yeah. So I, I just. Mm -hmm. Um, Hank, you're next, but I want to yeah. say if at any point, if anyone wants to speak, just Excuse raise your hand. Point of information. What did you just say about where 100 people were placed? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you've got a, so if you imagine like danger, damn, I'm about to get into professor language. Uh, danger distributed on a, on a curve, where there are some places that are really dangerous, some places that are less so. The places that are really dangerous become less dangerous by the very act of reclaiming them for the public, right? Now, now, now there's an open question as to how less dangerous they become. <laughs> but, you know, I, you have, to, I have to say that. But just the presence of people, like, wow, I'm not going to jack somebody here. Everybody's here. <laughs> I'm sorry to use academic language. <laughs> so the more people are there, the less. The, the, yeah, the more people that are there, the, the less dangerous. dangerous it is, yeah. Right, and, and and that's another act of reclaiming public space. It's not that we just have to reclaim public space from either the state or from corporations. We have to reclaim public state, public space from other en entities that are not necessarily interested in placing me. Thank you. And I would like to thank all of our speakers, including John and the nice young lady whose name I don't know Danielle. who was here, Danielle, who is doing the stack. I really appreciate everybody coming. I'm thrilled with the turnout, and I will be quiet now, which is hard to believe, <laughs> and we will continue to have our, our orders, and please buy a drink from Russell, because he's yeah. let us use yeah. his face. Here, here. Please buy a drink from Russell. Thank you, Russell. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
Great. After eight.